Hi guys, welcome to the channel. Um, this is grief class. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I lost my son uh, in 2018 from an epileptic seizure and he had been sick about 10 years before that. So uh, this channel is simply my way of um, letting you know what has helped me and the mistakes I've made along the way and what does not help me. It is not advice. Um, I am not a professional. So these are just um, thoughts and building a community where uh, maybe I can get some ideas um, to from you. So please feel free to post. I hope that you will subscribe. Uh, the topics I talk about are the ones that um, you don't see all the time on uh, on different forums or different places. They're, they're the questions that everybody has because I have other friends um, who've gone through things like this, but they're the things that just nobody talks about. So first on every video I do want to say that um, these videos are again kind of my story and what's helped me. Uh, first you have to be in a healthy place where you are not um, in a danger zone. Um, grief can hit people very hard. It can come on very suddenly if it's unexpected especially. And so that's why I have the suicide hotline number below. Please, if you are not in a healthy place, these videos can come later um, after you have a support network uh, with you. And also, um, it, I've had counseling and I. the only reason I, I have not continued it for the whole entire time is just travel distance. Now uh, that COVID has happened, there's so many counselors off offering Zoom meetings that I am probably going to pick it back up. It was so beneficial just to um, give my support group a break. And that's what this whole video is actually about. So um, professional counseling is nothing to be embarrassed about. And uh, I think a lot of what I talk about, it, it, it would be great topics to bring up with your, with your counselor to say, you know, um, you know, I, I didn't think about this. Is this normal at this um, point in my grief? Or, uh, you know, could this approach help me? And, and uh, so I want to get into this topic. It's a huge topic about having a grief support system, friends, family, your church, your faith, um, and then professionals. And that's why it's so hard because each one is kind of a separate topic. But uh, I was reading an article yesterday when I was getting ready to talk about this topic. And um, I've posted that article below. It's a Psychology Today article, and it's called Speaking of Grief. Tips for Grievers, Friends, and Family on Talking About Loss. And this is Jenna Baddeley, but the link is below. So the reason this struck me is because this is always in my heart and mind because I've been through this, uh, that people will change. You know, you'll have a group that supports you a certain way, but then when it gets harder or the path gets harder or as you reveal your grief to more people, um, people will drop off and it can be like a second blow, you know, to lose friends. Um, nobody has been mean to me and called me up and said, you know, I can't take this, I'm out of here. It, and that's part of the problem. I think I would have done better if friends would have called and said, you know, really kindly, like, this is just too much for me. I didn't realize, you know, what you were going through losing a child. And so having heard your story, you know, um, I just can't do it. You know, it's just too hard for me. Uh, even in the depths of my grief at first, that would have been fine with me. I would have said, oh, I completely understand. You know, I wasn't asking you to anyway. And I would have been really kind and it, it would have been very simple. But what I have found and part of what I want to talk about today is how awkward it is on both sides. Because um, for the person listening, uh, if they aren't, um, really wanting to do it, if they aren't volunteering to do it, they may back away right from the start. Uh, and that is actually less painful. You know, if you meet someone and you go to coffee with them a couple times and then they just don't call you back or you don't really feel it, you know, I guess that can be a little painful, but it's not a big deal. 
when it's painful is when people don't tell you and you know you think they're your friend you think they understand your grief and then they just kind of you know you just kind of stop getting invited and different things and for those of you who aren't this far yet I don't want you to fear it um, I again I don't give advice on my channel but I have really had to come to a place after three and a half years to realize that this journey happens to everybody. So that is um, one of my first points is that um, we feel like it just happened to us or it just happened to our family or this divorce just happened to our family and why can't people understand? Why don't they, you know, get it? Why would they turn away when we're in such pain? And uh, we kind of put that on other people. But I, I just remind myself, and this is my second point, is that, you know, this kind of happened to them. They didn't necessarily volunteer for this, um, which... Long term, I don't want friends who can't be there for the long haul. You know, if one of my friends suddenly goes through something devastating, I hope, I hope, especially after what I've been through, but I hope that I would be there. But um, I do know what kind of friend I was before this happened. Now, I would have been really there for my very inner circle. I would have been the person bringing you food. I hope I would have remembered a year or two, three down the road. I hope I would have been that friend. But with acquaintances, um, I, was, I wasn't I was oblivious. I still would have gone to the funeral, taken food. I would have done the initial things. But I do know that I was just so busy with my own family. Part of it was my son's illness. But I don't know if I would have been that person who two or three years down the line would have remembered my acquaintances and really taken care of them. And so business associates, people at work, um, kind of, you know, distant friends that you really care about, distant family. We do have, to, or we, not you, but I have chosen to um, have the perspective that they didn't volunteer for this either and even though I wish that they would come with me farther on this journey, I have accepted and learned that very few will. And uh, as I get older, uh, even before my son died, but as I get older, I only want a few really close friendships. I guess maybe because I'm not a super outgoing person, it means more to me to have those, you know, three to five people in my friendship group who I know I could call them up at two in the morning if I really had to and tell them, you know, I don't know what's happening. I just can't handle this. I, I would rather have just a few of those than a bunch of um, what I call fair weather friends, you know, friends who are around you, they think you're cool, you know, they like it if you have money, they like it if you travel, but when it really comes down to it, um, for whatever reason, and again, there's no blame, it doesn't mean that they're a bad person, it just means that that connection isn't deep enough between you and that group of people, and, uh, so they really couldn't be there for you. They, they're they not that committed. And I think that happens in every relationship that we have. As we age, as we, even if this death had not happened to us, to my husband and I, I still feel like that as you get older and you, you take different paths and your life take, you make different choices in your life, some of those old friendships can't come with you because they just don't understand what you're doing. And, um, so I just wanted to, first of all, let you know that if this is happening to you or if you've noticed people withdrawing, that it's not your imagination necessarily. Now, I do think we can become very sensitive when we're grieving and we do. I, I want to be um, aware of how sensitive I have been at different times. Um, sometimes I've just taken one glance or one thing someone said uh, or whatever, and really been hurt by it when they probably didn't even intend that. And um, But it was just my perception of kind of being embarrassed that I was in this position, that here I am, I'm 52, you know, we had all these medical bills, my son's passed away, every person I know on the face of the earth, every woman I know at church, every woman I know in town who's 52, has grandchildren already, and you know, I have to be very, very careful to guard my own self um, from making up 
things that people are thinking or saying when they aren't. So um, I think it's a I think it's a balance, and I know that if you're hurting right now to put another job on you, where I'm saying now you have to do this, and this is what I do, and and you have to not be so sensitive. Um, that's a lot, and I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that it may be something that. Um, this is a topic that you may want help with from a counselor. And when I went to counseling, yes, there was the death of my son. And yes, a lot of that had to be dealt with. What I believe about life, what's fair, why him, all of those topics. I've had to sort through my faith about, you know, why God would allow these kinds of things. But I also spent a lot of time in the counseling trying to figure out friendships and my life path now and what do I do now because I'm in this in-between stage where I'm a certain age and I have two remaining children who are wonderful and I'm blessed to have a good relationship with them but they don't have children so you know our family just has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and and you know when Tim died um, this whole social group of his you know it kind of shrunk and Tim was the most outgoing of our whole family. So people still talk to us and we still talk to a lot of Tim's friends, but you just felt like you were growing and everybody was starting to get married and everybody was going to college and everybody was gaining friendships. And then when the whole thing of Tim, all of that kind of dropped, dropped off and any hope of having a larger family with Tim and having children and, and, you know, in-laws, it just kind of drifted away. And, um, so I'm still, if I if I go back to counseling, um, which again with COVID and there's a lot of Zoom counseling now, I live in a very mountain town where there is no counseling. And I do want to talk about that. What do you do when you're literally in a place where there, it's you're like 40 miles from counseling? Um, thankfully, I think that so many people are having Zoom counseling and I don't think that will go back now. I think... People who weren't equipped to do it before, psychologists are now realizing um, that they can have such a bigger reach and they've got the technology. Maybe they weren't willing to invest before, but now they are. So I think that one little tiny thing of COVID has been good. It has um, made counseling services um, a lot simpler to get. But I can tell you that if I needed counseling going forward, if I do feel like I want some more um which I'm just a big believer in. I think it's great for kind of a life coaching type situation. And that's kind of where I'm at. Um, my life is really back on track in many, many areas and in many ways. But I do still think that my husband and I are trying to find our place again. We're trying to um, figure out who we belong with, who our real friends are. It seems like after three and a half years that you would already know this. But um, when my son was sick, uh, I, my husband too, we didn't go to as many things as we would have. We kind of bowed out of our social group. So ministry conferences and church conferences and, and things like that. We went to our local church and we stayed very involved with some people there. But anything in town, any kind of activities... Even in a small town, that's kind of your life because there's not a museum. Well, there is a museum, but you know what I'm saying? There's not a lot of like, hey, let's just go to the movies. There, There is no movie theater here. So for us, having people over, going to people's houses, that really is a lot of your um, uh, entertainment, I guess is the word I'm looking for, uh, if you're going to be with other people. So even when my son was sick, I really, really noticed that... Um, it was lonely. It was hard because I didn't expect people to reach out to me all the time. But on the other hand, I just physically couldn't. I, I was so busy and working. And so I noticed that people stopped just dropping by because probably when they dropped by, they saw that I was a night nurse and I was sleeping during the day and I was trying to work, you know, six days a week and get some overtime. And, and just slowly I noticed that people stopped just feeling free to drop by. And I never was rude or anything. I think they just kind of you know, heard, well, Tim's had seizures out in town. And, you know, and we, like I said, we live in such a small town that everyone knew. And so I think they probably realized we were struggling. And then uh, when they did come by, I'm sure I looked like I was just run over and haggard. And I, I 
was trying not to be. I was doing everything in my power to be positive, um, to be positive for him, to um, still go to all their school activities. But between all the trips to Denver for his treatments and then just the school activities that our kids had, that's about all we could do. And um, so even then, you know, we, we, without knowing it or meaning to, we relinquished a lot of contact with a lot of people in social groups. So we weren't making new friends or really um, getting to know new people like some, like some people do. And then when my son died, you know, everybody comes out of the woodwork and they're all happy and they're all helping you and they all want to do anything they can do. And there's that initial wave that just was only bringing you food and they do not want anything to do with this situation. They're nice people, but they just don't have it in them to do that. And that has to be okay. Um, I have had to learn not to judge another person's ability to deal with a situation like this. Um, some people hide their pain or their trauma, and so who knows why some people kind of disappear. It may be that they've been through something very similar and they just aren't ready yet. Or um, it could be preconceived notions, and this is, again, what I want to want to talk about. Um, we have to understand that people have the right to be who they want to be, and if they feel that they are very educated and if they feel like well, in this position, you know, a year, yes, but I wouldn't, you know, be seen crying out in public after the first year. Like, that would never happen to me. Um, some people have those kinds of thoughts. Some people feel like, um, and this is really hard for me because I am a Christian and I believe the church is a very positive place to be. I believe it, it's 99% positive, but I'm also a realistic person. And I've been in the church most of my life. And there are those people who feel like, you know, just get your Bible out, pick a verse, and then you go on with your day. And, you know, and if you're grieving, just, you know, Jesus can help you. And that's all you need to know. And I believe that Jesus has helped me amazingly. It's, it's a great testimony of how much the church and my church family and my, my faith have helped me. But it's kind of an ignorant view that some people do have that, you know, you don't need counseling if you're a Christian. You certainly should not be carrying this around. And especially after three years, you should basically never mention that in public again. Because, you know, Jesus should have healed that in your heart by now. And um, I think in my case, the thing, and it's all circumstances, um, I was really progressing well. I was um, getting counseling. Mm -hmm. I was... Um, doing really well and then COVID hit and I I was a nurse at the time proud to be a nurse and I was ready to really work hard I you know I had taken some time off I never quit working except for two weeks after my son died that's another topic that we'll talk about probably not a wise decision um, it was good for me I just don't think it was good for my coworkers. It was the best decision for me because I did not want to just sit around the house and contemplate what I had been through. And so I wanted to go back to work. It was great for me. But um, the point is, is that when COVID hit, I um, switched the kind of nursing I was doing and I was working with the elderly. And all of a sudden the doors were shut. They weren't allowed to go out. No one was allowed in. You were wearing a mask. You were getting things stuck up your nose many, many times a week to make sure you didn't have COVID. And when the elderly were um, going through their end of life stage, their families couldn't come in. So it was me trying to be that person who was with them during those times. And... Um, it was great for me, and in, in, in a sense, I was giving back. I felt really like I had a purpose again. I felt like I was doing something wonderful, and it did kind of take my mind off my own grief for a while, but it was really just barely uh, about a year, year and a half after my son had passed away, and I did kind of stop my own grief work. I stopped journaling. I stopped going to counseling. I started working more because I felt like I needed to help, and I'm glad I did, and I have a skill that people needed at the time. You know, nursing was very short at the time, so I felt like um, I needed to do that, and it gave me a purpose, like I said, so I don't regret it. 
but um, it definitely took like a year and a half. And even now, um, I, I resigned as a nurse about six months ago. Um, there are reasons. It's mostly because I had to make a choice between a business that I have and nursing. But I realized about myself that I can't work holidays, nights, weekends, 18 hour days because the last nurse didn't come in and you're the only nurse available. I can't do that until um, until or if I ever am in a better state. You know, the, the lack of sleep, the um, burdens of the people who you were taking care of, who a lot of them were uh, at their last uh, end of life care. Um, the loneliness and devastation of the people who thought they were going to the nursing home and they would see their family, you know, once a week or something. And then the families just weren't allowed to come in ever for a year, over a year. Um, you know, our, we're a very small town. So our nursing home was very slow to, to get mentally to thinking, Hey, you know, why can't they just say hi through the window? Or why can't they do some of these things? Um, maybe bigger cities and more progressive nursing homes did that early on, but our city, um, they're just now truly in the last like three to four months, allowing visitors, uh, church services, bingo, all these things that mean so much to a little elderly person who's kind of stuck in there. So anyway, I delayed my grief 100% um, for a year and a half. Now, it was a great time in the sense that I didn't think about it a whole lot. I just, I was busy. I was on work mode. And so in that sense, it kind of gave my heart and my mind a rest. And so even for that reason, I don't totally regret it. But as to this topic that we're talking about, people see me and they know it's been three and a half years and they think I should be at a different stage than I'm at. And so now more than ever in really the last few months, really, I would say maybe, maybe the last six months since I haven't been working as a nurse, I've noticed other groups of not friends, they aren't friends, but just other groups that I am a part of who, if I do break down in front of them, or if, you know, they hear that I've broken down or was crying or something, I've noticed a different reaction. It's kind of like a, okay, still? Like, really? Like, still? She's still broken up? You know, I mean, like, it's okay, but, you know, I would miss my child, I guess, but is she still really so broken up that she needs to cry, you know, in public? And, and, um, and I was kind of a person who would cry easily anyway. If I was at a movie theater, I would cry, happy, sad. Um, I still won't watch that one movie about the um, Dalmatian dog who dies in the end because I know the dog dies in the end and I'm just not interested. Oh, sounds like, speaking of dogs, sounds like my puppy, my husband might be coming in in a minute. But, um so I just won't go, won't even go see that movie because I just don't want to be the one blubbering at the end. So I was already a very kind of emotionally, emotional person who would cry at simple things. And so then you add the grief into it. So um, I have actually, you know, struggled not to cry in public. It's been something where I, I don't think it's wrong and I'm a very vulnerable person and I'm not a bit embarrassed of it, but I do think it has cost me something. And that's another point that she brings out and I'll try to find it quickly. And again, I'm going to post this. Um, she says that it's a short term comfort when you're talking about your story to people but it has a very long-term cost um, to your friendships and to other things. And um, she's trying to take it from the same point of view I am, where you want to have mercy on people and you don't want to drag them along on a trip that they don't want to go on. Um, and uh, so I just hope that knowing that this is a normal struggle and that friendships will drop off. I hope that that's all that I get across today, really. That's kind of my point, is that there's whole studies on how friendships drop off and how it's a normal situation. And I think what brought this up for me as I was reading one of the chat boards that I'm subscribed to and it comes into my Facebook. It's about, you know, different uh, people who've lost uh, loved ones. And... One lady said something, she posted, and she said something about, well, 
my husband forgot the date that my son died and I can't believe it. And, you know, I mean, what kind of person would do that? And then um, everyone chimed in. And instead of saying, you know, he's lost a child too, or maybe he was tired, or maybe, um, maybe he's just deep in his own grief and, you know, maybe he is a terrible person. Maybe that's why. Maybe he doesn't care. But I doubt that. I really doubt that. I, I bet it was just something where, you know, he, he just got the dates mixed up. Um, if I could tell you stories about how I've embarrassed myself in the fog that I was in of this grief over the past three years, it, you know, it's not even funny. It's, you know, there are people who probably think that I have all kinds of problems I don't really have just because they've seen me in this one instant and they made a judgment. And um, what was I saying now? Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, totally lost my train of thought. Oh, man. Oh, so, yeah. So, on this chat board. So, she posted. And I, I haven't read again like two days later. I haven't gone back in. I'm sure this is a really good uh, chat board situation and the people on there try to be in the middle they try to give the right amount of comfort but then some people try to give the right amount of you know uh, are you sure that you know that's how you feel about this maybe you should think about it um but for the most part this website really leans toward empathy and you know being okay with every single feeling you have and my first thought being a married couple who's lost a child together is you know excuse me, man, that poor guy, you know, he's probably deep in grief too. And then she's like, really going to go home and chide him for, um, you know, forgetting or getting the date wrong. And a lot of the people who chimed in were like, what? You're kidding. He did that. And um, it just struck me as a little bit insensitive as a griever to do that to another griever. You know, it just, I just thought, man, um, so I have determined in my heart to only deal with people who want to volunteer for this. Um, I'm not a perfect person. Uh, definitely now that I'm grieving, you know, I definitely am probably weird to be around at some level, even though I don't really talk to my best friends. I don't really talk to them that much. They send money for my son's scholarship sometimes and it'll come up then and I say thank you and I might even have a few tears when they hand it to me. And uh, around the time that we hand out my son's scholarships, I might break down a little bit and say, yeah, oh, I'm having to pick which of these kids gets a scholarship and I'm sure they can hear it in my voice and I'm crying. But for the most part with my friends, I still don't, you know, after three and a half years, I don't rely on them that much or retell my story to them that much. But I do want to make you feel better at my own expense. I want to tell you that I went to a conference in the last week. And it's a Christian conference. So it's all about, you know, a message and a sermon and then prayer time and worship time. And again, I know there are people listening who aren't Christians. But um, I went to this conference totally without thinking that I was going to have, you know, uh, outwardly let anybody know that there is still some pain in there. But the message was kind of about a hardship this woman had gone through. She didn't lose a child, but she went through a lot. And then there was another speaker who had actually lost, um, I, she didn't say if it was a miscarriage or an infant, but she had lost a baby, she talked about. And so, needless to say, I tried to be quiet in my own chair, but it did bring me to tears. I was crying. Um, I didn't have any Kleenex. So there's this lady that I barely knew sitting next to me, and I said, can you give me a Kleenex? And I meant for it to come out to where, yes, she could hear it in my voice, but it really came out like as some kind of deep grief, like, can you give me a Kleenex? You know, just like I was devastated all over again. And she is... I don't know if I'd call her a friend, but she's someone who's known me. She's had some uh, experiences in her own life with children who've had illnesses. So she's always very kind, and she just prayed for me. But I can tell you whether made up, imagined, or real, um, I felt like other people heard me, and I felt very awkward, and I felt like there was some surprise that after three and a half years that I kind of had a, a breakdown in public still. And 
I felt a little judged. And again, it's so hard to know. No one came up to me and said, now be quiet. You know, you're embarrassing yourself in this public. You know, that's the problem sometimes is that uh, no one says anything to you. So you're like, um, well, I messaged them and said I really appreciated their message. And they never messaged me back. They never said, thank you. Like, you don't have to say, oh, I'm your best friend now. And you understand and I understand and let's get together. I wasn't looking for that. I just was hoping for a, oh, thank you for, you know, saying those kind words to me. And so... Am I imagining it? This was a very small group, a very small circle of people. Um, they're all Christian women. Um, do the, you know what do they think? Do they think that um, you know Jesus should have helped me completely by now? I don't. I don't know. Um, these are the kinds of things that I stay or want to go back to counseling for because, first of all. Um, and this is five days later. I'm fine now. For, for a day or two, I still got up out of bed. I still did my work. I wasn't depressed. But for a while, I was like, oh, I'm never going to be normal again. No one is ever going to see me as anybody different but that person crying in the corner over having lost a child. No one is ever going to want a normal relationship with me because they're going to think that you know, at Denny's, I'm going to start wailing in, in grief and, and they don't want to be around me. And I just had a rough week, guys, because of that. Because I felt like I was progressing to where it's not all about me all the time. There are other people in the three years who now I should at least be trying to reach out to. Not that my grief is done. I haven't moved on. I'll never use that term. But I thought I was getting stronger, I guess is just what I'm trying to say. I thought that I could control my grief and especially with the last video I made about the, sorry, this chair is, oh, my leg's bent under me. I thought, especially as I talked to you about that dual process of grief, I thought that I had that down pat and I guess I'm just mad at myself and, and for no reason I'm not really mad at myself, but I guess I just, at some level, I'm just disappointed that I didn't have it down like I thought. And um, I thought that I had certain times, mostly at home or around close family and friends, where I could still express that grief. I still could do the work of the grief of letting it out and expressing it and talking about why it's not fair. And I have conversations with my husband all the time about, man, you know, um, it still just doesn't make sense. This certain aspect of Tim's death doesn't make sense. And we have conversations like that whenever our, either one of us want to, whenever it comes up. And that, But then I thought, okay, I'm doing this well. I'm doing this dual process grief thing where then I'm working on the good things. And I was going to this conference to try to fellowship and to be with women and to try to rekindle some friendships and to try... Sorry. And to try to rebuild, you know, myself as a person who can help and a person who has something to give. And, and I felt really, you know, not down, but just really, um, I guess it woke me up to the fact that, um, whether it's because of COVID and kind of the delay of that year and a half where I didn't do a lot of grief work like I should have. I didn't journal, didn't pray as much about the situation as I should have, um, didn't seek counseling. Um, I think it just surprised me that it kind of came out of nowhere. And the worst thing about it, and truly, I... By nature, I'm someone who cares way too much what people think. But then I'm also very stubborn and it makes me mad. And so then I refuse to care what people think. So by nature, I am very easily hurt. If you don't like me, if you post something bad for that one second, you know, it'll it'll hurt my feelings. Go ahead, you know, whatever. But then it'll just make me mad. And I'm so determined inside not to let that happen that I kind of come out the other way where I'm kind of, you know, I could get angry if I let myself. So... You know, I had all these emotions this week after three and a half years. 
of, you know, a little bit of judgment of the people involved. I'm kind of like, well, you know, okay, they're Christians. I guess Jesus just snaps and all their problems are gone. You know, I kind of felt that way due to the reaction of a couple things. And again, I shouldn't be doing that. In my case, I don't feel like I'm justified because they never said anything. I'm not even sure that they're feeling that way. So first of all, that's another point. You know, before you react, just make sure that that person 100% has done something to you. Then I feel like it's okay to open up the conversation and say, listen, you know, I know I'm a hard person to be around, but either get in or get out type thing. You know, that's fair. But I will share my stories they're horrible. They're so embarrassing. I have to dose them out in small doses um, to you. I can't tell you the whole thing at once or you would just be like, oh, okay. Um, but I have, you know, assumed, I guess, based on someone's behavior or even their facial expression that I was maybe being rejected by them. And you know, turns out they're actually probably a very nice person. And I didn't react too much, thankfully. It was more work situations and, and uh, you know, when you feel people pulling away, which is real, you know, I haven't always had the best reaction to that. There was early on, especially kind of a judgment like, you know, what kind of person would, would uh, not just come out and tell you that they, you know, couldn't handle your grief. Um, mm -hmm. And so we'll, we'll talk about that in another one. This is enough embarrassing that I uh, went to this conference and then um, cared at all what these women think. So what I've had to do all week, and I hope this helps someone, because I'm, I'm in a good place today. I am. It took about five days. What is, let's see, today's, um, today's Friday, so it was a week ago Friday. And I'm just the last couple days processing this and talking it over with my husband and my husband's my ultimate defender so if I tell him someone gave me a weird face he's going to believe it because he just loves me and he's I, I'm I'm blessed that way um but you know as I'm talking to him you know we take these long walks with our puppy and I'll show you my puppy someday here but uh as I've processed it I realize first of all these people only see me once a year and they, during the time Tim was sick, this is one group that I should have been at, but it's three hours away. And it's part of our church group and, you know, it's three hours away. And so these women, I, I wouldn't say I was best friends with any of them, but I, I'd see them and, you know, go to all these conferences two or three times a year. Then I would go to church camp and see them see different ones who worked with the kids during church camp. So basically maybe five times a year when I was younger and had really small kids, nobody was sick, everything was good. There wasn't this massive debt that we had to deal with. During those times, I would see these women and um, I would say that they were kind of co-workers or work friends, you know, even though it's not a work situation, it was similar to that. You know, a fondness for them, and they had it for me. And then I am the one. Now, it's not their fault that my son got sick, that finances got hard, that I pulled away and quit going to that. I just couldn't fit it in. I had to make priorities. I have no regrets about the priorities I made. But I, I've had to uh, remind myself of how weird it is for them that I'm now 13 years later showing up and trying to fit back in. And all of these women, a lot have moved and come and go. You know, people do come and go. And that's actually good for me. It gives me a chance at a fresh start. But unfortunately, where I live in Wyoming, it's a very, very small group. Everything's small in Wyoming. You know, we have one escalator, by the way. This is some trivia for you. Maybe we used to have two, but I think we only have one escalator in the entire state of Wyoming. So there you go um, if you need something fun to think about. Um, but anyway, so I have had to really over the last week remind myself what they're going through. And I want to be selfish. I want to sit and feel sorry for myself and think, man, what kind of women wouldn't let me back in? Why don't they let me back in after all these years? You know, don't they know that I lost a child? And don't they know that, you know, I never wanted to quit coming to these events? Don't they realize that 
um, I'm struggling and that I worked really hard as a nurse during COVID and don't they know that there was kind of a delay in my grieving and don't they realize what it would be like um, when you've lost a child that you have to rebuild your life now and that's the pity party I had the first, while I was there like you know because I kind of realized it even while I was there I was like um, and I shouldn't have gone alone that was my first mistake none of the ladies from our church could come and I should have canceled out then and just said, you know, um, none of my ladies uh, in the women's group are interested. And so I'm just going to say, you know, we'll work on it for next year. And hopefully there's a big group of women who want to go next year. But there just doesn't happen to be anyone who wants to go. And I didn't do that because I'm tough and I'm going to go by myself and I'm going to be an example to this group of women, first of all you know, how we can, you know, go away for a weekend, get a respite, you know, do the right thing, get away, renew ourselves at a Christian women's conference. So I'm going to be strong and, and be an example to um, these women in my local church that I'm trying to work with. And so out of stubbornness, I put myself in a situation where rejection was almost to be expected. Because I walked in there and just because I know their names from 13 years ago, and I've been there twice, I think, since Tim died. So in the last three years, but then COVID hit. See, I was, I was, you know, it wasn't quite as awkward because it had been maybe 10 years. But now with COVID and then everything else, it's going on like now 13, whatever it is, I've lost track. But, you know, the point is, is that, um. I walked myself into a situation that I was by myself, no women who know me. These women over here at the church, they see me almost every day or at least on a weekly basis because I work with some of them. Um, we do the same business and so they see me and they know that 99% of the time I am happy and trying to just work on myself to get through this um, or to get you know, not through it as in you're done, but just to move forward. And they see that and most of them seem to respect me for it. And and I have a lot of friendships because of that. But um, I forget that this group of women only sees me now maybe a couple times a year. And so the last time they saw me, and this is why, uh, I don't know why I walked myself into this situation. The last time they saw me was before COVID and Tim had only been gone about a year and everyone was fine with the fact that I had outward grief then. I mean, I wore it on my face and no one seemed to question. No one looked surprised. But I do think that for them now because of COVID and I'm coming in two years later and they're seeing it as some past event, which for them it is. For them, they came and did the right thing. They sent us cards. They made a few phone calls. To them, it's this past event. And so I just realized, you know, the only times they've seen me in the past really 13 years now, I was just unable to control my emotions. And so I've had to realize that for people who aren't grieving, even if they've even if they maybe some of them are and they think they've handled it and that's great, you know, great for them. But um, so I already talked to my husband about this. And unless there's like five women who know me really, really well from our own local own local group that want to go next year, if that many want to go and they all know me and we can sit at the same table and laugh like I always do, then I will go because I can talk to them. I can if I start to break down. One of them will exit with me and I'm good because they're that close to me. But I should not, I'm not ready yet after three and a half years or because of COVID, maybe it's only been a year and a half of grief. I don't know how to explain that. But some of you who have been grieving for a certain period of years, COVID probably had an effect on it. I don't know if it's better or worse, but it would have had an effect on you to see so many families losing loved ones. And I, and it definitely did for me, plus all the work I was doing. So I realized again, that those women are not to blame. Even if I am correct, and there is a little bit of rejection or a little bit of, oh gosh, can't she get through this? You know, even if that's true, I put myself in a position to be around women who may not understand or 
may be really trying to understand. I'm sure they're very, I know they're very good people. I do know that. So there is no sin or no harm done or, you know, they were trying to hurt me. It's just circumstances. And um, so now I, I made a choice this week. That's what I'm going to leave you with this week. And I want to make sure I got through all my notes. Um, I think I did. And, and this lady on this article, please read that. It, it, it won't just be me saying all this stuff. It'll be actual research that as time goes on, you know, you have to refine all of this. And it's a constant embarrassment. It can be. And it can be a constant job that doesn't seem like it's related to the grief at all. You know, I, I wasn't. And, and the thing is, too, and this might be weird to you, but why I was crying at this conference. Yes, there's always, I can make myself cry in a second if I think about my son or some pain I have. And the woman's story, it didn't help. But I still was uh, thinking about starting this website before I went to that conference. So I had that on my mind. Like, you know, is anyone even going to want this or listen to this? So I was trying to work through all that. And I have a lot going on in my, my career that's exciting, but it's scary because it's big steps for me to take. And I have so many things going on in my mind. And a lot of what I was crying about, it honestly was not at that moment about the fact that I've lost a child. It's the after effects of it. It's the rebuilding of my life. But I was actually crying because I just was, you know, at a conference. I had, you know, taken two days off work. I, some of the emotions, you know, that I was feeling that I wouldn't deal with because I was working this week a lot or the week before a lot to get ready for the conference. You know, I was in a in, in a place where I wasn't working and I didn't even turn my computer on for two days. And so I think a lot of that emotion just came out. So that's what's weird about feeling like maybe I was a little judged for still grieving my son when in this particular case, I was actually more um, just releasing some emotion about some hard things that I know that I, I want to do that are exciting but kind of scary. And I was just kind of letting some of that out. And I didn't want to correct the one lady who prayed for me and said, I know, you know, this must be a really heavy burden for you because she does know my son died. And I didn't want to correct her and say, oh, no, I'm good. You know, I'm fine. This is about something else. I didn't want to correct her. So I left her and probably a lot of people with the impression that I'm still just a wreck, you know, crying all the time. So um, now I forgot what I said I was going to leave you with. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, the reason I made this video is that um, it's okay to embarrass yourself in public. I think that it doesn't help you as a person. It doesn't help me when I add embarrassment or um, any anger on to other people. And I guess that's that's my point of the whole 47-minute video, and I'm sorry. But I, I just believe in being real. This is kind of a journal for me. So, um, you know, today's October 1st. 2021. If no one else ever listens to this and if it doesn't help anyone else, it has helped me. It's something I've got to clarify in my mind so that I can even um, put some of these thoughts and feelings. I, I do Evernote. I do journal on Evernote when I get around to it. But um, I just wanted kind of a diary of my own path. Um, I wish I would have started day one when my son died. But as you can imagine, oh my goodness, you know, to even have a thought to, to do it. I thought about it. I'm not kidding you. I, I'm not a YouTuber, you know, really, but I, I thought about, man, I should just for posterity's sake, just document what this is like. And I, and I, I would have, but I don't think it would have been helpful. It would have been literally years of me just crying and, and I don't know if it would have been helpful, but let me leave you with this, that in my mind, I made a good choice this week. Now it started out bad. It started out being a little resentful towards some poor people who had no idea. It started out with wanting to have some women who have no reason to volunteer to be my friend after 13 years of me being like out of the loop. You know, I was a little bit kind of miffed or a little bit judgmental. Thankfully, I didn't say anything. Didn't, you know, hey, you know, 
I came back in here and you're not my friend or I don't feel like you're my friend because I don't even know if they're not. You know, these are all feelings. We have these weird feelings. When you're when you're when you have all this emotion, be very, very careful about trusting your feelings. Um, just be careful. As time goes on, you'll learn to trust what's real and what's not. And that's why it's taken me forever, but I've learned not to react as much in the thing. Like I didn't give anybody a dirty look who I felt like might be judging me because I've learned that they're probably just tired and yawning and then I'm giving them, you know, some look um, that they don't deserve. So thankfully I recovered privately in the comfort of my own home mm -hmm. with my husband. We, we talked it out. You know, he wasn't there at the conference. He came with me, but he was in the hotel at night because it was a women's conference. So thankfully I processed it. I'm very proud of myself this week because I did carry a little bit of hurt the first day or two when I had tried, in my mind, I tried to reach out, tried to go to this conference by myself, tried to put myself in a position to kind of rebuild my life a little bit. This used to be anyway a group of people that I really cared about kind of being in with. Now I just have to pray about that. Is this, is this a group of people who now, after all I've been through and now that I'm 52 years old, is this a group of people that I want to put time into? Not because of anything they've done, just just have we all moved on? You know, that happens. Have we all just changed and have we all just moved on? And maybe that isn't a safe and a healthy place for me and not, again, not because of anything they've done. So I'm very, very proud of myself. I worked through it. Um... This is where I wish that I was in with a counselor just on a weekly basis. I do need to reconnect with one because I am realizing that I'm having a lot of these issues come up that are really hard for me to work through on my own without someone who doesn't know me because um, my husband cares about me enough that he always is going to err on my side. He's always going to kind of say, well, man, that wasn't very nice of them mm -hmm. if I tell him this story. You know, sorry, my phone. This is like spam because I don't know who that is. Um, so he's always going to, and he doesn't get upset or angry or anything. He's a very balanced person, thankfully. But but uh, he's, he's going to be too empathetic for a situation that may not have even happened. Do you understand what I'm saying? Whereas a counselor... That, that's where I recommend it so strongly. Um, the ones I've had especially, they were so good. And they would have maybe asked me, okay, so what evidence do you have of them rejecting you? And I do have one piece of evidence I shared with you where I reached out and said, hey, that was a great, you know, great message that you gave. And they just didn't say a word, you know, didn't respond to me at all. And... Um, not even in a polite manner, not like, oh, good, you know, like I said before, oh, good, we're best friends. Just not even a polite, like, oh, thanks for noticing, or oh, great, thank you, like you would on social media even. I mean, even if you don't know someone, I at least react to anybody who reaches out to me. So I'm very proud of myself. I did it on my own without a counselor. I moved my emotions back where they belong to where, number one, it doesn't even matter. If if they did reject me in that room, if I wasn't just dreaming that up, if there is kind of a thought, you know, this isn't an appropriate place, you know, it's not a safe place, you shouldn't be crying here. Even if that is the case, um, I don't care. I've, I cared four days ago, but I don't care now and I won't care again. I've moved myself to that place. So I'm proud of myself and um, I hope that what happened to me this weekend will help one of you, then it makes it all worth it. Otherwise, the last couple of days has not been worth it. Um, it's been kind of hard because I've been a little bit teary um, about friendships that may never renew. Accepting, I, I'm still accepting that certain groups and social groups just aren't going to come back. I know I'm saying the same thing over and over, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. I know I am just keep saying kind of the same thing, only in a different way. Um, I just hope that my videos give you hope, and I'm going to try to come up with the title so that when someone needs this, they can find it. That's the hard part. It's just when, when I needed certain things, I knew they were out there, but I just couldn't weed through all the forums and find someone who felt like me, and... Like this week, 
you know, I I wanted to be redirected. I did not want to have ought against anybody. It's a Christian term, I guess. I didn't want to be mad at anybody. I didn't want to be angry. I didn't want to feel rejected. I don't I don't like that. Um, I don't want to be that person who feels sorry for themselves. Yes, I have reason to sometimes. I should kind of feel bad for what my life turned out to be in some ways. You know, it wasn't fair that my son died. But I I don't want to be a person who um, doesn't move forward with life because of it. And I want to be a positive, happy-go-lucky person. And most of the time I am. And so I'm very proud of the work I did, the grief work that I did this week. I came out um, on top of this situation and I changed my mind about how I feel about that situation, whether I'm giving them too much grace and maybe they really aren't the best people. I'm going to find, I'm going to, like I said, maybe take a year off from going other than if there's a lot of interest and I can go with some friends of mine. If there's enough friends of mine, then I'll go and I'll start kind of seeing, you know, are these people that I want in my life? But if, if it turns out no, if it turns out they aren't willing or able or educated enough to be in my life because of belief systems that they have, I still love them. I still think they're great people. I still think they're Christian people. I still think that they are doing amazing things. It's just not going to be a path where they're enough for what I need or want to do in my life. You know, I have big plans, big things I want to do in my life, and it's going to take a very special group of people to kind of go with me on that trip. So um, I am so sorry this lasted 60 minutes. I wish I was more a person of brevity who could just give you six points. But um, on the other hand, I just... Uh, the videos that help me the most are just people telling their experience. That's really who's helped me the most in my grief path. So I'm going to sign off. This is much longer than I intended. Hopefully YouTube takes a big video like this. We shall find out. Have a great day, guys. Um, let me know how your week has gone. Let me know about this topic. And please look below for the article so that you don't think this is just all me. This is um, actually certified um, research about all these feelings that I've just talked about. Have a great one. Bye-bye.